we got everybody. I think we can call this um, meeting to order. So uh, in saying that, we're going to uh, start off with the Pledge of Allegiance. So if everybody could uh, help, help out with that. We got a lot of people on. Uh, Pledge of Allegiance. To the flag. To the flag. Which it stands. Under God, indivisible, liberty, and justice, justice for, all. for all. All right. I'd like to uh, get a motion to approve the present agenda. Motion. Can I get a second? Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you. Aye. Hi. I got to remind everybody that uh, these meetings are being recorded, and this is an opportunity for the uh, public, if they have any questions or comments, to uh, share them with us. And um, and we have a hand up from Miss Deloria. So. Uh, Jen, can you, uh, Sal, can you let Jen make her comment or question? All right, can you, can you hear me? I can hear you. Okay, I was going to say something happened, I think, when you promoted me that made my uh, thing reset here. Um, thank you for the opportunity to address you tonight. Uh, my name is Jen Diorio. I'm a math teacher in the high school. I'm also someone with higher than average risk factors as it relates to covid I'm concerned about three specific factors that I believe the superintendent and others are underweighting in their analysis of in-person versus remote learning. Issue number one is asymptomatic and pre-symptomatic spread. Uh, Iceland is a country that did not bottleneck on testing capacity and during the first worldwide spike did a broad lab testing of just under 5% of their entire population. They found nearly 50% of the people testing positive for COVID were asymptomatic on the day of their test. Some never had symptoms and some developed symptoms in the days that followed. At Duke University, a study called the Brave Kids Study found that nearly 40% of children who tested positive were asymptomatic. But the scary part was that they largely had the same viral load in their nasal areas, which researchers concluded meant they were as contagious as others who had symptoms. Our district policy is stated in multiple COVID-19 positive case announcements is that if more than 48 hours passed between when a person was last on campus and when the person began showing symptoms, that there is no need for contact tracing within the district and no one needs to quarantine due to possible exposure in the school setting. Asymptomatic and pre-symptomatic spread is real and this policy willfully and in my opinion, dangerously ignores that fact. Issue two, Department of Health data may not be accurate. It is well documented that people are lying regularly to contact tracers. There are lags in getting tests and reporting results and in inconsistencies in contacts being traced and told to quarantine. Add to that a segment of our population who doesn't buy into this being real or that masks and social distancing are necessary. All of that results in more contagious people out and about and in our schools. Reflect on your own personal experiences with regard to these factors and please think about the impact that could have on the DOH official numbers. Further eroding my confidence in the data is a look at today's school COVID report for New York State. In the reports by region section, I found the following numbers. For the capital region, which includes Chatham, the lab reported total positive tests for age five to 17 residents is around 2,400. The total for school reported positive students is around 1,700. Somehow the labs know about 40% more school aged children than the schools do. Now I understand there are homeschool students and out of area boarding school students as well as human error and slow reporting, which would account for some of the discrepancy. But I would also think that schools including 18 year olds and labs excluding 18 year olds would be a reasonable offset. But even if you don't see that it offsets, 40% or 700 student difference is a huge gap. Somebody's data is wrong. 
Issue three, is it enough? Mask and social distancing compliance does make schools safer than other large gatherings. It's safer, but is it safe enough? Is it safe enough for our staff who are more likely to be seriously impacted than our children? Is it safe enough for at-risk adults such as myself? It is not safe enough for me. Since Thanksgiving, I am scared every day I am in school with students. I'm scared for my own health. I'm scared for my colleagues' health. And I'm scared for my family's health. In my view, it is most definitely not safe enough. Dr. D'Angelo, <clears throat> excuse me, has made the point that according to recent New York State data, private household gatherings and community spread are the primary drivers of the rise in the infection rate. I agree fully that we are less of a driver than those, but we are a driver. We are contributing to the growth rate. We are contributing to the number of cases. In an environment where hospitals and ICUs are starting to fill, is that the right thing to do for our community? I'm hoping that those on the committee are heeding the lessons of the March spike and the Thanksgiving spike and the Christmas New Year spike that is happening before our eyes. Today's news is grimmer than yesterday's and who among us believes tomorrow will be less grim. Even though we may be contributing less to the growth, we are contributing. I believe we need to return to remote in an effort to contribute to flattening the curve rather than continue on the path of accelerating it while putting our students, our students' families, and our faculty and staff at this level of risk. Thank you for hearing me on this. And thank you, Jen. Um, we won't comment on, on that tonight, but um, we will get back to you and uh, I appreciate your uh, input. Does anybody else from the public have any questions or comments for the board? If um, you want to question or comment the board um, down in your, the bottom of the screen, you can raise your hand. It's literally uh, says raise hand. And that's how I see who's out there. Okay, so I see no hands being raised and- Greg, I have my hand up. I can see- No, you're, you're, no you're a board member. We're uh, out Prompt of public comment. Board member comment. And, we're, and we don't comment. I don't advise this board to comment um, immediately. So uh, we're gonna move on to uh, board comment. And please keep it to uh, um, business at hand or events that have taken place as a board member or public member. Thank you. Beth, do you have any other comments? I guess I just have a question on the report, the numbers that Sal sent us yesterday. Um, I do recall I don't recall that there being a, any teachers that were ill at the high school, but, I'm, but I see that there are a few that, were, that have been. Were they related to that student who got ill in December? <clears throat> Sal, Sal's gonna get into the superintendent's report. Um, this may be part of that, but Sal, okay. if you want to, uh, Comment. So um, I, I don't. Ha I have the numbers. I don't have the names behind the oh, numbers. I, names. I just no, no. I wouldn't give you the names anyway. Yeah, All I'm right. saying is that um, I believe that one um, of the cases possibly could be related, but there's no there's no empirical evidence to say that. Right? It's just a relative association. Um, the other thing that I, we're careful about in in is you can because of the privacy information, um, can, giving too much information that connects dots. I'm not in any way trying to be evasive, mm -hmm. but I would say to answer your question at a level that doesn't disclose anything, it, there is a, a likelihood that um, 
one of the employee cases at the high school was related to a um, to one of the students' cases, but I have no evidence of that. Okay. Thank you. Chris, you had uh, your hand up. You have a comment? Question? Well, I, yeah, I thought if I could, if this is the right moment in the meeting, and if not, let me know, Craig. But uh, I did want to uh, comment and raise the uh, topic of um, the potential impact of the new version or whatever it's called of the virus that we know uh, is in the area in, Sarato in Saratoga Springs, which I think will surely migrate into the greater capital region <clears throat> quite quickly. And I think that uh, with the chance of that spread being uh, much greater uh, because of the type of uh, version of the virus that it is. Um, I'm wondering if, if the state has addressed that with school districts yet, if we expect any guidance coming from the school, from the state, or how the board should consider, uh, you know, the, the potential impact of this. So I'll, I'll use the response during the governor's press conference today to give a little guidance in that regard. Um, there was an acknowledgement that um, there is an investigation on the variant strain um, that we've seen in the news uh, reported uh, as a result of um, some activity in Saratoga. But Dr. Zucker noted that the test for this variant strain takes uh, well over 40 hours at Wadsworth, and it has not been confirmed and it wouldn't be confirmed until midweek. So there, it's suspect, but um, to answer your question, there's been no further guidance on that strain. And as late as um, midday today, that was the latest that the governor reported uh, in terms of um, validating whether that was the case or not. Any other board members have any questions or comments? As Craig alluded, uh, and I'm not, please ask the questions. I, I, there's a pretty extensive, I'm gonna go over a pretty extensive amount of information regarding to COVID and our response shortly. Well, COVID's the, you know, it's the big topic. It's uh, worth uh, spending some time with. It's dangerous as we heard from Jen and uh, it's scaring people and we don't want that. So uh, I'm looking forward to a, a superintendent's report and we will uh, answer, we will try to our best to uh, make the best situation of, of this thing as we've been doing all along. And I thought the um, format we used last time, Craig, where after I give information, we'll open it up again um, for certainly for board comment. Sounds great. All right, moving along. If nobody else has any uh, questions or comments, um, you know, over the holidays we haven't seen each other in a while. Uh, there's been a we had the uh, um, Chatham Choir put out a neat little thing uh, Christmas and. I know uh, Eggers, been, uh, he's going to question me on, on the play that he did. And <laughs> <laughs> uh, so hopefully everybody got a chance to enjoy all that stuff uh, during their break. Uh, fine job by everybody involved and uh, appreciate it. It was, uh, um, once again, it was, the, it was a great thing for uh, the times and uh, – Chatham always seems to make the best of uh, bad situations. So very proud of everybody involved. And saying that, we'll uh, move on to uh, building reports. Uh, we have Andy on. He's going to fill us in on what's been happening around the school. <clears throat> Hello. Good evening, everyone. Good evening, Andy. Um, my first day with the district was July 1st. Um, so five, five months into it, um, jumped in head first with, um, COVID planning and changes and, um, finishing up the project, um, COVID planning and securing PPE and, um, trying to fight, uh, follow state guidelines, um, took up a majority of my summer, um, to try to bring everybody back safe. Um, and then the construction project, um, trying to finish up. Last minute change orders, a few additions, getting the shed built, 
Um, and then going over the punch list to make sure contractors did what they were supposed to do. Um, then back to COVID, we, um, we changed cleaning standards. We also changed products that we were using. Um, we brought in some additional like long-term disinfectants and things that um, are, weren't really standard practice. Um, long-term disinfectant for buses and things like that. Um, just to try to do everything and anything that we could do to try to mitigate it. Um, rearranging classrooms and putting things into storage so we could do social, social distancing. Um, and really the biggest challenge was securing supplies, Sur securing masks and getting uh, the nurses fit tested and things like that. That was um, basically my, my 2020 at a glance. You can see it's mostly uh, COVID for the most part. Um, pushing ahead to 2021, um, COVID is ever evolving. So depending on recommendations from the state and things going on, um, we're going to make changes to make things better and, um, just continue to work, uh, diligently on it. Um, we can't get lazy at this point. Um, with the building, buildings themselves, um, one of the big things we're, starting to implement is the work order system. Um, we had a company come in and take a mechanical inventory of all the items. So like your air handlers, um, univentilators in rooms, your boilers, all that type of stuff. Um, they took an inventory of it and, and we're setting it up on schedules so that it automatically populates so that we can stay on top of the maintenance. Um, I really think this is gonna be great for faculty and staff when they have a problem, emails, usually there's one or two or maybe three people on an email. Once they start responding and then I have to try to dig back to answer them back, it kind of covers up some of the information um, where a work order is more concise and I can email that teacher directly, like parts were ordered or, um, you know, worked on your unit, fixed it. Like it's, it's more clear and concise instead of trying to chase down emails. So I'm excited when that comes through. Um, and also, I think having a written um, schedule for all maintenance items um, that we can check off and then nothing gets left out of the loop, um, I think it'll be great. Like parts or maintenance items, it's all gonna be right there. So it's gonna make it a lot easier for the staff to figure out what they need to do. They can look at the work order and say, okay, I need to bring four filters and a fan belt and go and do the job. So it's not like going to the roof, figuring out what you need, going back down. Um, so it's gonna be a more efficient use of time. Um, another thing that I, I started and I'm gonna continue with is cleaning up the area around the pump house and, um, you know, searching through all the equipment that's outside, putting that in the building, and then um, anything that's not useful, um, surplusing or, you know, finding another use for it. Um, there was a big pile of metal out there. We roughly took away 200 yards of scrap steel. Um, we ended up using uh, Kelman's. They came, they didn't charge us for pickup or drop off. Whatever we put in the, in the bucket is what they paid, paid us for. So we ended up uh, getting rid of that big hazardous pile of steel that was out there. It's starting to look better, but we have a long way to go on that. Um, and then one of my other, my other goals besides all my other duties is really trying to make some field improvements on the school fields. Um, there's a lot of like just patchy areas, um, just a lot of improvements that could be done. We could be using the seed evader to aerate, um, aggressive overseeding to try to knock back the weeds and um, also fertilization. And the goal of that is to better playability and safer playability for all the students. And it'll look nicer for the staff as well, you know, faculty and staff and people who enjoy the campus. So those are some of the, the bigger things um, that I'm looking forward to in 2020. Um, any board members have any questions or comments for Andy? Andy, I'm sure uh, those patches and stuff, um, 
I, I'm really hoping that uh, we, we've done some, or you take the opportunity to do some soil samples uh, to make sure our pH and stuff is right. That's the soil, sam soil samples too will help like with phosphate. So my, I have my uncle, his brother, and my two cousins are horticulturists and they manage golf courses and they're commercial landscapers. Um, so I use them at Hoosick Valley to bring their fields up to par. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so we're going to do soil samples. Phosphates, we cannot put down unless we have a soil sample that says we have low phosphates. Um, really, the fields are are probably like in decent shape, a little fertilization and, and utilizing the seed evader we already have that implants the seed in. Um, so it has a better germination rate will be a huge help. And if you have like a bare spot and a soccer crease and you leave it, it's just a place where weeds start and then you mow and then you spread the weeds all over. So it's very difficult to get the state to allow us to spray fertilizers and do a treatment. And the way that you control it is by aggressive overseeding and fertilization to keep an aeration to keep the lawn healthy itself. Um, yeah. And then if you have a real trouble spot, if you mow that spot, you clean the mower to not spread the weeds. So there's, there's some different things that, that I've saw, you know, over the couple of months that I want to change and, and improve um, on that as well. We, we, we typically uh, struggle with uh, low pH and that, mm -hmm. that when the pH gets so low that um, in our area here in Craig, I don't know if you can hear us. I think you froze. Yeah. I didn't know if that was my computer or what. Hmm. Questions or comments for Andy? Yes. Uh, Craig, there's Matt and Chris have their hands up. Okay. Matt. Uh, yeah, I, I'm uh, looking forward to the attention to the grounds. I know um, there's no particular issues uh, except for I know that, you know, we've got this six week, week period of um, pretty okay weather between when it, you know, when frost breaks, right, and, uh, and the end of the school year comes. Um, any accommodations we can make to get our students and staff outside. Um, I, I, don't, I don't know if we, if we, uh, we, we brought the picnic tables out in the fall. Um, if there's any other type of accommodations like that, especially if you need resourcing, now's the time to, uh, perhaps seek that, that, that feedback. I'm sure you've been, you've been thinking about this to us uh, as well, Sal. So. Uh, Andy, if you're gonna go, you know, we did, uh, Kristen with Andy's assistance purchased um, that large number of um, Home, Depot, Home Depot buckets, which are temporary, it flipped over our temporary seats for students. So not only can they keep their stuff in it, but they can go outside, flip them over and teachers can have uh, appropriately socially distanced classes. I know that's one example as well. We still have the uh, picnic tables there on um, the high schools. We did move because that's where we pushed the snow. Um, but once, you know, the weather gets semi-decent, we'll have those picnic tables back out again and, um, you know, try to get them back outside as much as possible. Uh, I know Chris has a question too. Uh, I just wanted to um, make one general comment about the work order system. I was really pleased um, when Andy came to suggest that. Uh, an IT guy at heart. Uh, I think it's going to give him a lot of data. Um, you know, we, the board, the, the board members who have been doing this for a while, I know that some of our um, goals and priorities around facilities um, and maintenance that we discovered under the last um, capital project, where we kind of got a few things that caught up on us. Certainly the work order system is going to be, give us the uh, ability to um, search for things that might be frequently breaking or give us some data and history to better inform our decision-making going forward. Not to mention to judge, um, you know, workloads and, and assignments and, and all sorts of, um, you know, good metrics that we can use and rather than um, uh, anecdotal kind of in inferences. So um, appreciate that, Andy. Yes, that is, uh, that is a great tool. Uh, Chris had a question or comment for you. Yeah, two, two comments that are not really related, but uh, the first is I don't know if this district has considered doing any type of uh, analysis of the envelope of the buildings. Um, 
you know, using any kind of imagery to see if there's any significant uh, envelope leaks, you know, whether that's in windows or doors or roof or whatever. But in the wintertime, that might be a good opportunity to do that, you know, with the heating system on. Um, so uh, just curious. We've, we've, we've actually done it in the past, uh, Chris, um, Excellent. a few years ago. Uh, it, it did uh, our, our weakest links. I'll, I'll give you a, a spoiler alert. Uh, weakest links were our roofs, believe it or not, which Andy probably, if he's been up there, understands more than any, but it was mostly due to uh, water leaks over the years. That's but, uh, we did we did do that once, and that, that was pretty neat to see. Um, the other question is the, uh, for lack of a better word, the chunk of gravel and earth that's kind of pushed to the side of the of the entrance road to and is the town that's the town putting that's the in. town yes it's actually a village yep it's that's village property or or railroad whoever wants to argue uh they can but it's not ours aha uh -huh. okay yeah. part of its uh railroad and part of its village Craig, this is Muriel, and since yep. I have not learned how to raise my hand yet, <laughs> I can't figure this out. I do have a question for Andy. Sure. Sometime when we're in a facilities meeting, and I'm, this is not an emergency, but I would like you to take, I'd like your opinion on our baseball field. I'd like you to take a look at it, mm -hmm. and, and I'd like your take on that baseball field. Um, I can, I can give you some. A little bit. Okay. Um, with the top dressing in years past, um, as I understand it, they were using like a kitty litter type product on it. Mm -hmm. um, not the right thing. You want to use um, kitty litter is clay and so is like a turf face or like a, a, a baseball drying media. But mm -hmm. baseball drying media is kiln dried. So it actually makes it like rocks. So it doesn't mush back to clay. Mm -hmm. um that's kind of one issue so we have some drainage issues i think from you know so many years of past use um some of it is is the way you put it to bed you, you put it to bed at the end of the season if it's all weeds and all that you have a very short window before they get out there on that field yeah. so you have to put that field away like you're going to play states <laughs> on it mm -hmm. that's the way it's got to be because then once it gets nice the kids can get right out there and do what they need to do mm -hmm. um the turf needs some work, you know, there's some edging, there's some things that, you know, some maintenance that was kind of lacking. Same, same goes for the, for the softball field. Um, we did groom it a bunch of times before the end of uh, fall winter. Um, but there, there's definitely some work on all the turf for throughout the district. Okay. Thank you. We'll, we'll talk further about that eventually. Okay. Sure. Thank you. Thank you. I, I also have one more thing um, about the um, the electrical. Um, it's kind of unrelated to the other two, but um, we did finally get the bill from LaCourt. Um, the bill was $111,783. Uh, um, $59,000 was labor. $36,000 was materials. And $15,000 was uh, equipment use. Um, the the main cause in the the report was um like water infiltration so if there's water that sits down in the pipe somewhere like there was no there was actually no pipe but if there's water that's sitting somewhere and you get heaves over 50 yeah, years so you could cause a crack um and that's kind of what he he's blaming the event on um he does see past flashovers um, before I came, I guess the last two years we had that leg drop um, and kind of shame on nice egg for not catching it. Um, the same leg two other times, I guess, I guess no one else, uh, you know, really paid attention to it. Um, so that's basically what the, what the report was, was saying the problem was a little bit of age too, as well. Um, yeah. 50 years uh, doesn't help them. But I can tell you that for a fact. <laughs> um, the materials for it, you know, it's highly specialized, you know, high voltage materials. 
and the labor is high because it's not regular what they consider low voltage it's high voltage work so that changes your labor rates unfortunately um, oh now i can yeah you um it's a, a substantial upgrade to the electric that we had there we should be able to go another 50 years without a problem and somebody you know somebody could end up if anybody has any questions uh, about that. Thank you. Uh, Ted, Ted had his hand up. Go ahead, Ted. Labor materials. What was the third item? Um, like equipment. So we had uh, bucket truck usage. Thank you. Um, saw cutting, things like yeah. that. Track hoe to dig the, uh, to dig the trench. Andy, can you comment on fuel? Did that, that, we still have to add in um, the fuel cost. We still have to add in fuel costs, which are roughly $500 a day uh, for 10 days. So we're looking at roughly $5,000 worth of fuel that was used, a um, little less than 10 days. And the generator rent rental was included in LaCourt's invoice, correct? Yeah. Yes, it was. Yeah. But but the fuel wouldn't have been, right? No, we, we did the fuel because we got state okay. contracts. Yeah. Right. So it's a dollar less a, a gallon than what would the, the court would pay. Yep. So we, I said, we'll we'll do the fuel. Yep. Thank you. And we and we we sourced that local, right? Main Cares, which is always good. Yes. And and I had pull what you know because we use Main Cares so much. Um, you know, coming on a Sunday isn't a normal thing for them. So, but they're like, we know you guys need us. We'll be there. You know, no problems. I'm like, hey, whenever the guy wants to show up, we're good to go. But. Um, main care was excellent. They really are a good company. They're, they're a good neighbor to us. Um, anytime I call, you know, the emergency without them, it would have been a bigger emergency. That's for sure. Uh, Matt had his hand up. Matt, do you have a question or comment? Matt, you may be muted. I Sorry. Don't see you. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I, I did look at the report. Um, and you know, it came in right at the end of the year, right? And I uh, just, but while we're on the top topic, have we done an assessment of how we're going to pay for this? Do we think that there's going to be any combination of of insurance claims on this? Or, I mean, it looked like it was age-related failure. So, uh, and then the, the, the follow-up would be, you know, if it, if it, um, if it becomes an emergency, uh, how much of that expense is going to be that emergency expense? Well, well, I, I can answer that question. So, so I submitted everything. I finally got the report, all the information, all the bills have gone to the insurance agent. They're looking at that now. They're going to review that. I'll follow up uh, in a week. Because um, you're right, I read the report that's iffy with the water, the 50 years. It kind of, you know, some of the report helped us, some, some of it didn't. So if this does, if it goes through insurance, great. Um, we'll submit it. We'll 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 proceed that way. We owe twenty five thousand. We get the rest reimbursed. If not, then I will um, work with our architect and our lawyer to put an emergency motion on emergency capital project. We've done I've done about five of these in the district over the years or four. We'll put that on, and then we would submit everything in, and we would get fifty percent uh, reimbursement on that. So th those are the avenues we're gonna go. We're looking at the insurance first. If it's denied, then we will go through the emergency ca capital project. And you know, there's a, there's a very good chance that that will go through and we'll get half of that money back. So I can, I can sum up uh, what I saw and what I witnessed and Andy, I'm sure will vouch for me. But um, 50 years ago, they didn't need to use PVC. It may not even been, it wouldn't even have been PVC. It would have been probably a, a metal tube. Um, or concrete, but they didn't need to bury cable um, with that type of protection. And the cable use was pretty impressive. But the problem, the biggest problem was, is that school was built in a gravel bank uh, for people that are new to the area. And it was never meant to have a roadway over top of that uh, wire and that that's turned into field access and parking. Uh, so that, that backside of that school has gotten a lot of use that, you know, had we right. known that was going to happen 50 years ago, maybe it would have been done different, but 50 years, 50 years. So um, there's no point in fingers at anybody. It's mother nature. It's, it's the way we used it. Um, it's a lot of uh, things happen there. 
we we did put it in pipe obviously um we also put in a box that has a loop so if the tra the transformer we have now we bought from net uh night seg night seg gets away with different things because they can write a spec so they can still put it in a trench where we can't get away with it um which is fine i would rather it in pipe there's too many too many moving parts at a yeah. school um but our transformer is called an open face transformer, a live, a live front. So they're, you know, they're not put in anymore because they have more safety features that are put in um, the newer transformers. And you need a little more wire to get deeper into the transformer. Um, so we have planned for the future in case that transformer does fail, that we'll be able to replace it without a huge expense again. Excellent. Thanks. Uh, Ted, uh, I see your hand is either up again or still up. So if you have another and comment. Just okay. um, one, one last comment about, I also, um, in terms of um, school safety, school security, um, I have a piece of the new cable under my desk. So it, it will behoove anybody not to come in and, and <laughs> in an irate position, but it is pretty impressive. I Andy um, got me a, a piece of scrap and yeah, it's uh, quite a souvenir. So. You probably can't even buy that anymore. I, I wouldn't even think it's pretty. It that, that's, well. a piece of, that's a piece of the new stuff. Yeah. Oh, okay. All right. But I'm going to keep it under there just in case. <laughs> okay. All right. We'll uh, move along, I think, then. Uh, everybody's good and thank you andy uh bringing us up and uh thank, your... thank you guys it's been an honor and a pleasure the last few months and uh, i just want to give a, a shout out to my staff uh, they've been wonderful my secretary working with mike chuddy and and sal has been great to have support especially when you're the new guy on the block and trying to find your way you're lost in the hallways of the school as it will <laughs> and uh, i just want to say thank you to all of you thank you thank you yep Excellent. So um, we're going to move on to uh, superintendent's report. And hopefully okay, so, uh, tonight I'm going to use some different um, uh, slides or uh, uh, some JPEGs and some, some PDFs. So bear with me as I kind of manipulate all these uh, visuals to try to make uh, reinforce what I'm, what I'm talking about. So um, most of my report tonight, like everything we're doing is focusing on COVID, um, and Jen, thank you for bringing your concerns to, to our attention. Uh, you made some very salient points. Um, the, I forwarded the, a copy of the um, communication I sent to staff in terms of our, our decision to open. I did want to update, um, and again, I've got several different um, slides here. I, I want to start out by sharing my screen here. I want to start out by just up slightly updating um, a grid that I copied the board on yesterday. This is where we are as of uh, close of school today. Um, these numbers go back to our earliest case of a staff person prior to school starting, which had no impact on us, to the cases that have been reported to us today. So. Um, we have several employees and several students uh, in terms of positive cases uh, across uh, several of the schools. Um, kudos to the middle school. We have not had any uh, employees there uh, test positive. The, uh, the governor um, reported today that the capital region, and again, it, Jen brought up a good point. It re really depends which website you go to and, and whose numbers you're using. Uh, for many of the purposes of the conversations that we have in the Questar region. And, and we use what the governor and the state um, site puts out because we feel that that's what he's gonna use to make some of his uh, decisions. Today, he reported that the capital region is at 10.12% yesterday at 9.91%. Um, but this is where we are in terms of the positive cases that we've had, had today. Um, just making sure I have my notes here. So let's talk a little bit about um, some testing. There are, um, and, and I'm gonna also address a question that Matt had asked uh, at the last meeting that I've still been trying to uh, track down uh, a good answer to um, in terms of 
a, a variation of testing, surveillance testing. But there, there really, I, I break testing down into three categories. Um, I break it down into testing that might be a result of one of the governor's um, declarations that we're in a zone, a yellow, red, or orange. We've talked a lot about that. Those metrics have, uh, have changed slightly since we began this conversation several months ago. Um, there's testing in terms of what Matt referred to last time, which is surveillance testing. Could we, could we uh, test um, proactively to really gauge um, what Jen was talking about, which is a, a truer uh, positivity rate with, within our buildings. And then the last category that I put it in, and that's typically why these rapid tests were created, would be a, a, what we call a point of care test, um, a test where if we had um, a, a suspected case of a student or a staff member, would we be, get to the point where you know, one of our nurses could administer one of these tests to give us some, some, some additional data to make some decisions on. Um, if you recall, um, I sent the board a copy of the communication um, that we sent to, to parents. Uh, we used the platform that we used to um, uh, seek daily COVID screening information. Um, and again, I, oh, sorry, wrong one. Is that me? Muriel, do you have tap dancing going on? I tell you, it's Matt. No, that was me. That, that was a, a, a video. It was audio from a video that I was I was going to share with you. So um, I, I'm really discombobulated with all these different slides that I have ready for you. Um, this is uh, I'll go in the order of the slide then. So this is um, a slide from the uh, public website, in, and the data goes back to yesterday, showing that the um, positivity rate in Columbia County is, is 6.7. Um, and as you can see, slightly lower than some of the other adjoining um, counties. So not, um, not encouraging, but certainly not as bad as, as the capital region as, as a whole. Um, so we, when, we when we talked about tests, you last heard me report to you that um, if we were to test in schools, and we have not made that decision, but it would be irresponsible of us for not, to not be prepared for that um, potential, um, uh, uh, potential. Um, we, Columbia County um, had offered us to operate under their limited service license, LSL, but also Questar on behalf of all the Questar schools applied for uh, that license. We were just given a copy of our license and now we have an LSL registration um, for Chatham, which means that should we get to the point where we do testing uh, in schools, we are uh, we can do that. Uh, this also gives us the ability to order the test kits through Questar. Um, let's see here. I'm looking for one other slide, but you, you also had heard me report that um, the 20% is 20% of the in-person students attending. And that would roughly be about a, a students and staff attending. That would roughly be about 186 uh, students and staff that would have to be tested over the course of a two week period. Um, to prepare for that, we sent out yesterday that electronic communication, which I thought I had a screenshot of, where um, we were asking parents, here it is, it's, it's not shrunk down, but uh, we, we asked parents to provide uh, their consent for testing. Um, the parents in, in our group tonight should have seen this. This went out electronically, and I'm, I'm pleased to report that this went out uh, overnight and um, as early as um, uh, the sunrise this morning, parents were starting to respond to it. And as of the end of the school day today, we had approximately 130 um, uh, students with consent. So we're, we're doing really well. Regional districts are reporting real high numbers, 85, 90% of parents um, indicating that they would allow their student to be tested. Uh, we had a meeting today, the principals, the nurses and I, to specifically begin to discuss this and all the logistics and challenges around it. 
Um, and you know, there, there's a lot to it. We're already stressed in terms of staffing. And so we have to carefully navigate what impact going into a testing program would, or a testing initiative would, would um, have on our, on our operations. Um, Lisa is working uh, as our data expert uh, with Narek and Questar to build the um, spreadsheets, the uploads that we will need to keep track of the testing results, and then ultimately report that back to Questar, who is responsible as the person who is um, holding all the licenses for us to re return um, that to the state. Um, to my knowledge, um, anyone who tests positive um, that gets reported to the state system eventually makes it back to the county. Uh, and so we, we really, to speak to how we get notified, we really get notified through really two primary sources. We either get uh, notified through the um, nurse who is a liaison to schools in Columbia County when they are notified of positive cases within the county. And often, and, and many times, it's a report from parents regarding private testing that they've had. We don't take anything verbally. We either need confirmation from the Department of Health or we ask the parents or staff person to provide testing result documentation so that we make sure that we're reporting accurate information. Um, the Abbott um, Buy, buy not, buy X now card. Um, I want to talk just a little bit about the testing and then I'm gonna, I think it's important to show you just a quick little video. But basically you've heard me describe this. Um, this is more of a visual of instructions. It's basically a card, you're gonna see it in the video. Um, the, the sample is taken by swabbing, swabbing both of the lower nostrils. Uh, a reagent is placed on the card. The swab is slid under a secure tab and 15 minutes later, um, you, you interpret the results. There's a control strip, and uh, not to go into depth, but if the sample strip means, uh, matches the control, control strip, you'll see that you have a positive outcome. And there are some uh, you know, invalid results as well. So that's, that, that's kind of just a quick little um, glimpse at what the um, instructions look like. What I think is important, and I'm hoping the audio is gonna work on this, is I think it's, it, it'd be, um, to, for the comfort of those who are wanting to know what the testing is like, I'm going to um, play this short video. It's just music. You have to kind of read as you go here. I'm going to stop that they just go through the same process with an adult. A couple things that you saw there, um, you saw that, that the, the operations generally require about three people, a greeter who's take, uh, taking um, the receptionist, if you will, the greeter who's identifying the, um, the participant uh, then and giving them a card that is coded. They then go over to the um, sample station. That's where we do, and we talked about this before, do have to have a licensed medical professional, not because that's required by the manufacturer or the state. It's more of a requirement of our insurance company in terms of professional liability. That medical professional takes the sample, 
you see that they're in full PPE. That's an N95 or KN95 mask, a face shield, gloves and gown. Um, the receptionist um, can be in just a regular mask and face shield. And then that sample is put over to an area that, um, as you saw, the, the, the test kit is, is um, the sample is secured by closing the test kit. There's a self-adhesive piece of material. And then that goes over to a station and a timer is set for 15 minutes. And then the, the results are interpreted like um, you're seeing on the screen there. Um, you've heard me mention before that other schools report that you roughly can do about 45 um, tests um, in an hour when you get good at it. We would know that if we embarked on this initiative, it might take us a little longer at first until we get things um, you know, accounted for. You've also heard me talk about that 20% that mark. Um, that kind of equates to um, roughly five to six persons a day. We don't see us doing this on a daily basis. That would be, we would think, grossly inefficient. We would see that if we embarked on a process like this, we could see um, spending maybe a morning, a couple hours, one morning, um, each of two weeks. Um, uh, and then uh, at the buildings, um, maybe we could do a, a morning in one building and an afternoon in the other, because what we have to do is worry about scheduling and staffing and um, and, and the logistics around this. So that that's kind of um, a little bit of what we've been discussing. We're meeting again on Friday to um, address some of the questions that came up today and, and continue um, trying to figure out that if we were to test how this would work. If um, we did tell parents that if um, we would let them know if we started a testing program, certainly. Uh, and then also if a student tests positive, then that student would be have to be discreetly um, separated from their peers placed in the isolation room. The protocol after that is that we would notify parents just as if the student was symptomatic and that parent would, uh, this, the recommendation is that parent seeks a medical opinion. Uh, and the recommendation is well, even though you get a positive test on these antigen tests, a positive test is usually recommended for follow-up with a PCR test to, to confirm a positive result. And then likely the student uh, would be uh, quarantined. And then we would have to, uh, um, if a student tested positive in our program, we would also have to weigh the impact of any contact tracing that may be a result of identifying a student, an A, if you will, within our building, those students, teachers who may have come in contact with them. So that's just kind of a glimpse as we as this evolves as to what discussions we're having and um, what's taking place in, in regard to testing. Uh, a little bit about vaccinations. Um, if you've been watching the news, um, uh, lately, uh, the governor's been very critical of, of different hospitals in, 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 in the state. Um, these vaccines are being distributed. Um, in some places, there's very low participation. Because of that, they've extended the, the, the categories for which um, people qualify for A1, uh, which is phase 1A. Did I say one? I meant phase 1A. Uh, we were notified, I think, on Sunday during my meeting with the um, three county department of health and the quest our superintendents that school nurses those involved in our testing program and therapists ot pt and speech would be eligible to receive the vaccine should they um, agree or consent in in phase 1a and as late as this afternoon i started to receive some information in terms of um, some uh, vaccine uh, locations in manans and coming up um, uh, and I, I, I'm not gonna tell you the, the location because it's only by invitation this weekend as well that, that our um, nurses and others would have access to as early as um, the end of this weekend, this weekend. It doesn't mean they have to be vaccinated um, in the next few days, but they would be eligible in this first phase. Um, the governor stated today, um, and it's fairly consistent with the other information that we have, that um, likely, um, Teachers, uh, uh, school staff will be likely in 1B, and that's probably roughly about four weeks away. Um, you know, it, it depends on how fast they accelerate the, the distribution, but we're, we're looking at probably somewhere in the beginning of February for the possibility for staff to be, um, to be, to be vaccinated. We, uh, and I don't know, Lisa, if this got out this afternoon, if not, it's gonna go out tomorrow morning. We have crafted a survey uh, going out to all staff. Um, we've been asked to do uh, two things. One, we've been asked to find out 
uh, in terms of our staff who's interested in being vaccinated. Questar 3 is asking for us to uh, secure those numbers. My sense is that the state wants to be prepared uh, given that in the three, four week time frame that um, there's gonna be some uh, facilitation of vaccines to school personnel. So um, I don't, again, did that go out this afternoon or it went out this afternoon or wait? It, it's out, yes. It's out, okay. So uh, out this afternoon, we asked uh, staff to respond by the end of the day tomorrow, uh, indicating just some, some quick questions. Um, in addition to who they are and where they work, would they be interested in the vaccination? Yes, no, maybe, or to provide some other information and what category they fall into. We've been asked to separate it between general staff and those that identify themselves of having increased risk as defined by the CDC. And if you recall that list, that list has been out, um, that CDC designation has been out probably since the spring or summer. And that's where the comorbidities, um, you know, hypertension, um, diabetes, some of those uh, higher risk categories present themselves. I don't know if that's gonna result in any priority administration of it, but they wanted that separated. Uh, the last thing that we decided to also ask for, so we had some indication of how willing the staff would be to participate in our testing program is we asked if we were to do a, a, a testing program, would you volunteer to be in that testing pool? Um, it is the sense of most superintendents who, who, who've been doing this for the last week or so that um, getting to that first 20 or 40% of people uh, within their employment that would be interested in participating in testing um, wouldn't be that difficult. But we, want, we didn't wanna make that assumption. We're really asking staff to, to kind of give us some indication as to how, what their comfort level is in terms of their participation in, in um, a testing program as well. Uh, last um, uh, on COVID, well, and, and one slightly related to COVID is, um, you know, uh, Jen brought up the, the, the decisions, uh, you know, the, I will tell you that the, the, the principals who are on this call and are invited to um, say something if they like, and I um, probably go through um, great trepidation every day in terms of the decision to stay open or, or to go fully remote. Balancing the discussion between um, what's in the best interest of students, um, you know, in terms of being in person, socialization to the extent that we can socialize uh, in, a, in a socially distanced environment, um, and, and our ability to interact with students and provide them quality instruction versus the challenges that a hybrid model brings and, um, and what a fully remote scenario looks like. And we've, we've acknowledged this in the past. First of all, you know, our teachers have done a tremendous job, uh, not only in the spring, but continue to do in the fall. I have a lot of parents comment on a regular basis um, how pleased they are with the, with the effort. It's not easy. Um, to some extent, uh, and this is a little bit of a generalization, I think um, the hybrid model is the toughest of the three. Um, it's like pick one, you know, teachers do have always taught traditionally in person, they do that well. Um, teachers who teach fully remotely have gotten into a groove, but trying to work in between those two modalities where you have half your class one day and half your class the next day is extremely difficult. Um, so there is some argument that we have uh, some debate in, in, in deciding what's in the best interest of students. So John, um, we've had, since Monday, we've had a number of parents um, requests going full remote. Um, as of, let's see, as of four o'clock today, John shared with me, he had 16 more requests um, of the 320 students in the high school, 117 are now full remote. We're just under 30%, 37% of our high school population has requested to be full remote. Uh, I do know that Mike and Kristen did have several parents uh, at both of those buildings want to switch over to remote. What the board um, should have seen in their email today was a copy of a notification that the principals constructed with, with, with my approval and, and input. Um, and, and this is a little, you know, difficult sometimes for parents to understand that we, it's not easy to move kids in and out of the model um, at a moment's notice. 
And so some parent requests were coming in this week, like, I would like my student to be remote for a week, or I want my student to be remote for two weeks. If you really understand our model, especially at, at MED, where we have full remote sections and we have full in-person sections, it is very difficult. Um, the transferability is not easy. You can't take a, a student out of an in-person class with one teacher and plug them into a remote class per se, especially when some of the sectioning doesn't work out. Some of our remote sections are now very, very, um, the capacity is very, very high. Um, uh, our capacity is very low, the enrollment is very high. And so one of the things that we sent out today to parents, and we certainly respect parent choice, we've done that from the beginning, we created a fully remote model in response to the demand from parents and urging of, of, of the governor as well. But they have to understand that they need to make a decision and they're gonna have to stay with it for a while. So what we communicated with them is, if you would like to go remote, you need to go remote to a demarcation. At the high school, you need to go remote to the next quarter. And at MED, we need to go uh, remote to the next trimester. You can't bounce in and out of these modalities. It's unfair to our teachers who are already strained and stressed from so many different aspects of COVID. So I wanted to share that publicly with the board as well. Uh, before I open it up for questions, the only other thing I wanted to show you, and, and, a, and a, again, a shout out to, um, to Matt, who brought this up at the last meeting. And let me just get rid of these other slides to make sure I, um, oh, I was gonna start out with this. Um, th this kind of makes me feel like where we are again, right? Just like um, just like March, anybody's familiar with Groundhog Day, we, we, we've waking up, woken up again, and uh, it feels like we're, we're going through this all over. But what I wanted to show you was, um, we have um, put together a little bit of a campaign as you know, uh, staffing um, is, a, is a challenge. We have teachers who are, um, and staff who are legitimately sick or being quarantined uh, and other reasons why they're out. And um, in a year where we have people, at least at MED, split up into multiple classrooms, we have um, teaching assistants and aides also providing an extraordinarily valuable role in, in helping us make all this work. Um, and maybe I, uh, I'm going to, oh, there we go. We created a campaign that said, um, you know, basically we need your help. Uh, it's this, this rolled out this afternoon on Facebook and the, and um, the website, but it'll, it'll go out to uh, the entire um, school community tomorrow. And really um, it's, it's asking anybody who might be, comfortable uh, at home, whether they're um, a retired teacher or um, can be a teaching, a substitute teacher, could be a teaching assistant. Uh, we need uh, perhaps nurses who are working second shift and would like to pick up, um, you know, a half a day or a day with us to help us in our testing. Um, no matter what it is, we can use substitutes across the board. So, you know, I remember back when we were doing the town hall meetings in August, I used the special emblem when I was reaching out to CUNY and saying, you know, people reach out to us and say, how can we help? Um, I'm asking that um, the board also play a role in this in disseminating the message that if you know anybody who is comfortable in coming into school during this time, who could help us out um, to put them in contact with us, we'll let them know exactly what they knew, need to do to fill out an application. We do by law have to do a, a background check. Maybe they've already have it uh, because they've worked for us before or whatever, but we'd certainly love to welcome some additional help to get us over this next uh, few months. So that's that's been released today. So I apologize for the choppiness. I, I, I had a much better script in mind um, and the visuals uh, threw me off. I gotta put those into a PowerPoint next time. So uh, I'm gonna open it up for um, any questions that you may have. Does anybody have any questions for Sal? I'd also ask if, if the principals who are on um, want to fill in any of the, the gaps that I created or have any anything that they would like to add, I, I'd certainly welcome that. We got Matt. Matt has his hand up. And yes, Muriel, I'll teach you how to do that. Okay. But you, got, you got to show me how to do a, a shuffle a change. change. Okay. So <laughs> last time I asked about this, I think um, – uh, I know what you're going to ask. Go ahead. <laughs> Maybe. Uh, last time I asked about just distribution of test kits, right? Yes. Things were a little bit blurry. So I, I heard you mention 
that we would order through BOCES. I presume that's the Abbott cards, right? Yes, that's the only rapid test available in the state right now. So talk to me about what you know about, uh, I guess, the um, distribution logistics there in terms of requests. Yeah, that's... Will they that's, turn around? Yeah, so that part's easy. And then don't let me forget to tell you about it, it as it relates to surveillance testing because I, I didn't give you the full picture there. So um, the governor, and again, it, uh, as the latest today... Um, there's still some confusion around the zones. Um, you know, there isn't, isn't clarity. Even the media asked him, one of the uh, reporters asked him in his question and answer today about um, the zones. It, it, you know, we, we've blown away the initial metrics in the zones. And it seems like right now, hospitalization rate is really driving, um, driving the ship. Um, today, he referred to no hospital being um, any, at any, um, rate higher than 30%. And, and all along, he said, if it ever get to 85, that's when he was going to, you know, kind of slow everything down. But with, with that said, he's used the 9% um, positivity rate in any community to, to kind of invoke testing. And he said um, this week that if, if a school wanted to stay open, they could, they could start testing when it hit 9%. And as long as their positivity rate was under the 9%, then they could stay open. And then he said, you know, staying open or not staying open is a local decision that he was not going, that he, he, he recognizes that, you know, government doesn't make that decision, uh, localities do. Um, I have been trying to get a straight answer on surveillance testing since um, December 23rd, the morning after um, you had asked that. I, I fired that off to Craig, who fired it off to the uh, DOH. At one point, we thought we had an answer, which was yes, that makes a lot of sense. We would provide test kits for that purpose, uh, whether it was that purpose or the point of care uh, concept. And as, as late as four o'clock today, uh, Craig emails me and says, I, I need to um, correct that right now the state is saying that they don't know if they're going to use the stockpile to allow schools to do surveillance testing so it, it here we are now a couple weeks in from the question and we still don't have a straight answer but i can answer your original question which is supposedly uh questar requested twenty six thousand test kits based on all the data that we gave them they're expecting fifteen thousand to be delivered tomorrow craig says he has confirmation on that that's plenty for the first round of testing that anyone wants to do. And all we have to do is we have a secure um, email to request how many test kits we want. And they are delivered within uh, 48 hours by, by BOCES courier to our, to our school. Um, I neglected to tell you that our nurses did go through, Abbott has a, a small, as you can see, it's not extraordinarily complicated. Our nurses are very bright and talented, um, but, um, there was a small training that BOCES spun up about two weeks ago. Our nurses have, I think two or three of, two of the three of our nurses have had a chance to do that. In addition, as part of the LSL licensing, BOCES has to come out and watch a nurse do one test and certify that they're qualified to do it. That once he gets the test gets tomorrow, they're going to start scheduling that later in the week. Uh, we also have one of the, our BOCES employees, one of the Questar employees at BOCES lives in Chatham. And um, she has offered that if we ever place our order that she would personally um, bring the test kits here for us. So, uh, you know, it's, it's seemingly what I've been, what's been reported to me is that once we place the order, we should be able to have the test kits um, in, in no more than, in, than 48 hours. Um, just as a follow-up comment to that, um, I know uh, we there's mixed feelings across our, our demographic base about testing, it's scary. Uh, but but I am at least um, a firm supporter of testing as early as possible if we can get a hold of these. Um, I, I, I certainly am not looking to the governor's office to say that we have to test. Um, that, that's all. All right, thank you, Matt. Uh, Destiny had her hand up. Destiny, you have a question or comment? Uh, yeah, just a quick question about the vaccinations for teachers. Regardless if we go remote, like if a school has to shift remote for a period, do they are they still um, qualified or not qualified? Are they still in that 2A uh, category? Um, I, I actually think it's going to be 1B, um, at least what uh, I know. Oh, sorry. And I wouldn't see them changing where they fall in that priority. I think um, if there's any you know, if you follow the logic, even if we were remote for the next few weeks to kind of get over the hump, 
we'd want to get our teachers who are willing to be as vaccinated um, as soon as possible. You know, the governor says that, you know, he's not a scientist, but, um, you know, her, her and, and Craig and I had this conversation based on some of his experience with animals, you know, herd, herd immunity is only accomplished when a large portion of, of the population is, is vaccinated or has, has the um, antibody. So, you know, I would think that they would, my speculation is they would keep teachers right where they are now. Perfect. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Destiny. Uh, Chris, you have a question or comment? Yes. Thank you, Craig. Uh, I just wanted to, you know, note my support for testing. I, I do believe it, it would uh, greatly benefit uh, the community as a whole uh, if, if we can get uh, implement that as soon as possible. So I'm in full support of that. But I had a question about um, the, the, do we have an area designated on the ground as to where testing would occur? And is it multiple locations or? So um, that was part of the discussion today, working with the building principals who know their buildings well. You saw in the video, they used the conference room at, at Questar. I mean, you need an area sufficient where you can have some nice separation between the three stations. So you need a staging area for students to be socially distanced. That could be a hallway. Uh, I've asked the principals to kind of take a look at their building and, and make a recommendation based on each building. Um, although, um, as I mentioned, um, the 20% um, it can be done. It, 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 it doesn't have to be, um, well, let me put this back. There, there's not a lot of clarity around the 20%. Some say as long as you do 20% in the two weeks, the only uh, variation to that is they're suggesting that 10% each week, but you could do all 10% in that one week or break it up. We, as I mentioned earlier, you know, we think that uh, a half a day in, in each of the buildings, um, but it would seem logical that doing a testing in each of the buildings would give you a better representational sample, even the, and, and the students need to be randomized of what's going on within each of the buildings, as opposed to saying just 20% of the people who are willing to be tested could be skewed if it ends up being a lot of people just at the high school. So I, I, I hope that makes sense. But I, uh, we, what we envision is an area that's large enough to have enough space and a little bit of a waiting area because the recommendation is that after a student test, you don't send them back to the classroom. You, you wait the 15 minutes um, so that you see whether they are positive or negative and you don't send them back if, if they're positive. So we would need an area large enough to hold the eight, 10, 20 students. Um, if you figure, um, and, and Jen's my math teacher, but you know, if you figure you're doing, um, let's do some rough numbers. Let's say you're doing, um, 20, uh, 40 in an hour, um, you know, every 15 minutes you'd be able to release, uh, or every few minutes you'd be able to release some kids that test results have come in. So, um, but areas like a half a gym, a cafeteria, the sunroom at MED, um, I'm not as familiar with some of the areas that we might use at the high school or middle school, but th that'll give you kind of a general overview. If I could follow up to that, is it possible we could consider areas adjacent to the school outside with maybe some sort of tent? You know, yeah, tent absolutely. Um, that that, that um, has been something that uh, that I think some of the other schools have, have discussed as well, drive through and um, the, the, it, the logistics around time of day, uh, some schools are setting this up from four to eight at night or on, on a Saturday. Uh, I've seen some of the schedules that other districts have published. Um, in talking with our personnel, the, the, the preference is to do it during the school day. Um, there didn't seem to be a lot of um, receptivity to doing it outside of the school day or on the weekend. Um, so we would be probably relegated, but we could certainly consider, um, you know, a, a, a tent, a small you know, pop-up or something like that. Uh, one of the criticisms of that was just that it could, you know, get to be very cold for students at this time of year to be out there waiting the 15, 20 minutes between the time that they have their test taken and they're waiting for results. So, mm -hmm. but, you know, I, I don't think that today's meeting was really just kind of a brainstorming and to try to figure out all the different ideas and all the considerations for what we'd have to do if we actually uh, implement a testing program. All right. Well, thank you. And I just have a, a reminder that very shortly coming up, um, you know, this is the new norm. And I noticed that 
we have a lot of attendees, but I, don't know, I hate to even use call them attendees. There are staff, there are teachers, there are employees, there are community. Um, and we have this section called public comment, a second one. Well, I'm not calling you guys public tonight. I'd love to hear from anybody else that has any comments because this board has inquired about um, time in and time again, uh, how everybody's feeling. We don't know unless you tell us. Um, Sal uh, does a great job referring back and forth and building super, you know, building heads, try to keep us informed. But I noticed that there's a bunch of um, teachers and staff on and uh, it was great hearing from Jen. I'd love to hear from more people. And uh, our second, when it comes around, our second public comment, which is, I'm not even going to use the word public, uh, our, our participants, our attendees. So um, in saying that, if nobody else has any more questions for Sal, um, a great report. It uh, answered a lot of questions, Sal. Thank you. And, uh, you know, it's a tough time right now. And uh, we need to work together and know what's going on out there. So uh, I appreciate it. And saying that, we're going to move on to uh, R38. I'm going to need a motion to accept a consensus agenda as written from G through I. No move. Can I get a second? second? Any questions or comments on anything in there? All in favor? Aye. 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 Anybody opposed? Motion carries. Uh, items for future agenda. Is there anything out there that we need discussing or to put in? The future um matt matt so i don't know if this deserves its own uh, agenda item um but it seems like uh, we're into the new year we basically know what our stimulus looks like i presume at some point the state's going to actually have estimates for us um but of course want to hear some words on that um next time around as i presume the picture will be a little clear all right. Well, Matt, like I was, uh, I talked to Ted earlier. Um, I'm not sure exactly where we are on our um, schedule for uh, budget uh, talks, but I got to say that they're coming up soon. Um, if you think that, uh, you know, you remember how from last year we go through that segment at a time and stuff like that. If Do you feel that some of your concerns or questions can be addressed I think, through that process. Yeah, I think really just like a three minute status update next time um, is really all I'm looking for. Not really a, a report. All right. Um, Mike, uh, um, is that something, or Sal, is that something? If we get some information, there is no information as at this time. So obviously we need to get information. I, the good thing is we're going to start, we're supposed to start going over the executive budget end of the month, um, you know, in finance, and then it's going to be in presented the first board meeting in February. So that'll be very interesting to see. I'm, we're all waiting for it. What are we getting? What are we going, getting next year? You know, we're sitting in limbo. I sit in meetings every week trying to just get, you know, there's no answers right now. There is some stimulus, but we don't know how that's going to be distributed. So that will be brought up as soon as we get some information, you'll have access to that. And I'm hoping end of January at our finance meeting, we have information. Um, so we got to start moving forward. So Matt, that's similar to uh, some Ted, some of uh, Ted's concerns. And uh, I'm going to uh, um, assume that that will be an agenda item in the uh, near future. So I don't know that we actually necessarily have to add it. Yeah, I, I was just thinking if there's information from the state before, you know, to give, you know, we have this meeting coming up in two weeks, right? And then another week, I, I would like a, as much lead time before the finance meeting as possible if, if there's new information from the state. If there's nothing, then there's nothing. Yeah, if, if something comes out, we'll, get, we'll definitely get stuff out in a Friday report with Sal. All right, sounds good. Uh, Beth has her hand up. 
Beth. I, I just have a quick question. Where do we stand on the federal aid? There just seems to be so much back and forth in the last few weeks with the, um, the you know, the stimulus and whatever. Are we getting any federal aid this year from the federal government? Are we, is the state getting any aids for the school through the federal government? Um, Mike. Yeah, we will be getting some, you know, they, they, they agreed on some amount to the states, but we just have no idea what's going to, how it's going to filter down to the schools and how much Chatham specifically is going to get. Okay. So that's what we're waiting on. And like I said, I'm, ho I'm assuming this is going to, as we go into the, you know, for next year's budget too, and then this year's, we're just waiting on these numbers. So it'll be interesting to see in the next week or two, but as soon as we get something, like I said, I can get, we'll, I'll sit with sale. We'll, we'll get information out to the board immediately and then we'll discuss. Again, it, it, day to day, this changes. And, and Mike, if I if I misspeak, please correct me. But you know, our our CARES Act money was under two hundred thousand dollars. If I recall, it was like one ninety four or something like that. I've heard numbers thrown around um, uh, at at the federal level that we might be looking at two or three times our CARES Act money. So just hypothetically, uh, even if we're looking at six hundred thousand um, dollars, remember that the twenty percent reduction that the state uh, was talking about was just under a million for us. So I think it's safe to say that no matter what comes out of this, it's not going to be as rosy as we'd like. And then we'll, we won't speculate until we actually have numbers to talk about. But is that consistent with some of the things you've heard, Mike? Yeah. I mean, if, if they use the same formula, but the big issue is the poor districts were getting hammered, right? And the wealthier weren't. So that's going to be interesting how they're going to distribute that. Because they're making major cuts to the, the poor districts, which I, I can't see that going forward. That's going to happen. So that's why two to three times what we got, that'd be great if we got that. If we got six, eight hundred thousand dollars and, you know, if we had a million dollars. I mean, we can we can balance all that because we have our reserves and we, we banked over a million for this year. But I, I, I'd like to see, you know, it's all speculation at this point. So. I'm hoping we will get information. I was anticipating the end of January, you know, when we go to that meeting, we would have information. So that's what I'm still anticipating. All right. So it sounds sounds like future agenda items are coming anyways to us. Um, I don't think we'll add a new line for 21 yet in uh, the parking lot. Um, unless some, uh, does anybody else have anything to add or question on uh, the future agenda. All right, I just want to say one more time, uh, I'd like to, you know, we don't usually hear from anybody at this point, but this is the segment in our uh, meeting where we open it up for second public comment, but uh, I actually want to extend it to uh, some of our staff and our teachers and in public, any of the public that are out there that we haven't heard from. So uh, um, we have a hand up from uh, Jill Chetnan. Uh, love to open her up, uh, Sal, to public comment. There's Jill. Yeah. Here's Jill. Thank you. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Um, I, I think it's really nice that Craig, that you just asked for that. And I wasn't planning on speaking, but I really, um, I just want to say I appreciate that you want to listen to us and just the thought that was kind of going through my head. We used to have a liaison committee between the board and um, the staff, and that might be an idea to, I know, I know it hasn't happened since I've been president, so that was before Sal, um, but that might be a good idea to reinstate that. I Jill, I, I was the last person on the uh, liaison committee and uh, our previous <laughs> superintendent really never let it happen. <laughs> it was just a uh, name on a list. But uh, absolutely, I thought that was a uh, important role then and I think it's more important now. So I uh, appreciate that. And thank you. Um, thank you. Uh, is anybody else have anything to add or say or help us know where you guys are at? I, I hate to put, we got a hand up by AB. 
coming your way. Craig, I'm going to need a name for the minutes. Yeah, you're going to please have to state your name, AB. Sorry, it's Abby Brown now. Oh, hi, Abby. <laughs> hi, I know I'm <laughs> all of you. Hey, there we are. Oh, hi. Okay. I just wanted to thank uh, Jen so much for speaking so eloquently at the beginning of the meeting. And I wanted to just weigh in and say that I, as a teacher and a parent in Chatham, I'm very scared. And I just wanted to communicate that with all of you. Um, I don't know when else to say it. So thank you for listening. Um, this is very, very hard for the staff, especially those of us who see everybody. So um, I welcome you to reach out and ask any specific questions anytime, okay? But it's, it's hard. Well, thank you very much, Abby, for um, speaking out and letting us know some of this stuff helps a lot. Thank you. Anybody else out there? I, if you don't know how to raise your hand, um, I can give Muriel and some of you guys a, a lesson. If you scroll down to the bottom of your uh, screen, with your, you'll hit participants. Yep. And when you hit participants, you'll open up a little side screen, and you'll see panelists and attendees. At the bottom of that, when you scroll over onto it, you'll have your opportunity to raise your hand or not. Hey, we also reopened up the Q and A um, feature. So if if uh, if you can't figure out the raise yeah. hand at the bottom of your um, screen, there should be something called Q and A. If you if you open that up and and just send a quick uh, question like "Please promote me" or "I'd like to speak," um, I I can see that as well. I just want to give this a couple. Did I? Hear I did it. Awesome. Craig okay. Muriel has I her got, hand up. I got the uh, I got the shuffle ball lower, change coming. Lower hand. Got it. Thank you. Got Thank it. You. Got it. Um well I appreciate everybody joining us and hopefully you had an opportunity to uh, learn some stuff on a very important matter. Uh, thank you, Sal, for the update on COVID and where we're at. And I can't say any more and buy any more time. So uh, <laughs> thanks, everybody, for uh, attending. Hopefully it was a good meeting. No hands? A motion to adjourn? We're going to... Uh, Ask for a motion to adjourn. So move. Second. Any questions or comments? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you, Craig. Good night. Thanks, Craig. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.